SCP-3008, Object Class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. The retail park containing SCP-3008 has been purchased by the Foundation and converted into site. All public roads leading to or passing by site redacted have been redirected. The entrance to SCP-3008 is to be monitored at all times and no one is to enter SCP-3008 outside of testing as permitted by the senior researcher. Humans exiting SCP-3008 are to be detained and then debriefed prior to the administration of amnestics. Dependent upon the duration of their stay in SCP-3008, a cover story may need to be generated prior to their release. Any other entities exiting SCP-3008 are to be terminated. Description: SCP-3008 is a large retail unit previously owned by and branded as IKEA, a popular furniture retail chain. A person entering SCP-3008 through the main entrance and then passing out of sight of the doors will find themselves translocated to SCP-3008-1. This displacement will typically go unnoticed as no change will occur from the perspective of the victim, as they will generally not become aware until they try to return to the entrance. SCP-3008 is a space resembling the inside of an IKEA furniture store, extending far beyond the limits of what could physically be contained within the dimensions of the retail unit. Current measurements indicate an area of at least 10 kilometers squared with no visible external terminators detected in any direction. Inconclusive results from the use of laser rangefinders has led to the speculation that the space may be infinite. SCP-3008-1 is inhabited by an unknown number of civilians trapped within prior to containment. Gathered data suggests they have formed a rudimentary civilization within SCP-3008-1, including the construction of settlements and fortifications for the purposes of defending against SCP-3008-2. SCP-3008-2 are humanoid entities that exist within SCP-3008-1. While superficially resembling humans, they possess exaggerated and inconsistent bodily proportions, often described as being too short or too tall. They possess no facial features and all observed cases appear to wear a yellow shirt and blue trousers consistent with the IKEA employee uniform. SCP-3008 has a rudimentary day-night cycle determined by the overhead lighting within the space, activated and deactivating at times consistent with the opening and closing times of the original retail store. During the night, instances of SCP-3008-2 will become violent towards all life forms within SCP-3008-1. During these bouts of violence, they have been heard to vocalize phrases in English which are typically variations of, the store is now closed, please exit the building. Once day begins, SCP-3008-2 instances immediately become passive and begin moving throughout SCP-3008-1, seemingly at random. They are unresponsive to questioning or other verbal cues in this state, though they will react violently if attacked. SCP-3008 is known to have one or more exits located within, though these exits do not appear to have a fixed position, making it difficult to leave SCP-3008-1. Once inside, using any other door besides the main entrance to enter the structure or breaking through the walls of the retail unit leads to the non-anomalous interior of the original store. Since containment began, 14 individuals have managed to exit SCP-3008. Following extensive debriefing, all individuals have been administered amnestics and released. Incident 3008-1 At 037 on 2000, a human male exited SCP-3008, followed 10 seconds later by an instance of SCP-3008-2. SCP-3008-2 caught and killed the man before itself was terminated by armed response personnel. This incident represents the only time an instance of SCP-3008-2 has been seen exiting SCP-3008. A full autopsy on the corpse is performed. C-3008-2 Autopsy Log for more details. The man was carrying an IKEA-branded journal seeming to document his time in SCP-3001. Transcribe below verbatim. So I'm writing this to document what I can only assume is my sudden descent into insanity. I can't possibly be that bad of a navigator, and yet, as I write this, I've been trapped in this IKEA for two days. I haven't seen another person in the entire time I've been here. I thought it was a prank at first to turn the place into a maze, get all the people out, and see how long it takes me to get lost. Then everyone has a good old laugh. I realized that wasn't the case when I tried to backtrack. Everything had changed, so I ended up lost. Instead of the exit, it was just row after row of bookcases. So I'm trapped in Ikea. Sounds like the setup for a bad joke. The lights went out at 10pm. Nearly gave me a heart attack. The loud electrical thunk sound, and then pitch blackness. The place is full of beds, though, and my phone had a torch in it, but no signal. So I found a bed and went to sleep. Spent most of the next day trying to find my way out with no luck. 
did find a restaurant serving those meatballs, though, so at least I won't starve. That's probably the punchline to the joke. Anyway, they were still warm and fresh, but I haven't seen anyone around who could have cooked them. Made my way back to the beds before the lights cut out again, since it's too dark to search with them off. It's 9.10 a.m. now, so the lights came back on a little while ago. I'm sure I've searched the entire area around where I came in, and now the exit obviously isn't here. So I'm going to pick a direction and hope for the best. Day 3 of my Magical Ikea Mystery Adventure If I wasn't sure there was something seriously weird about this place before, I am now. I've walked for 3 hours in a more or less straight line, insert Ikea joke here, before I came across a ladder next to one of those huge stock shelves they have here. Climbed up to get my bearings, and looks like this place just stretches on forever. Like that scene from The Lion King, except instead of trees and grass, it's all shelves and tables and crap. I did see a person moving not too far away though, so I headed over. I thought it was a staff member at first. He was wearing the uniform, and hell, maybe it was. Maybe freakishly seven foot tall monsters with long arms, short legs, and no faces, or just the kind of thing that they want working at Super Ikea. The thing completely ignored me though, and with no eyes or ears, I can't even be sure it knew I was there. Though, I thought about shoving it or something to get its attention, but its hands were big enough to crush watermelon, so I decided against it. It just kept moving along, and eventually I lost sight of it, so I decided to carry on the way I was going. Anyway, no comfy bed for me tonight. Looks like I've entered the improbably hard and pointy table section of the store. Guess I'll have to make do with some bunched up tablecloths. Phone battery died during the day too. Didn't work anyway, but I feel like I've lost some kind of vital lifeline. You ever see one of those cartoons where they're going through doors in a hallway and they just pop out another door in the same hallway? That's how I feel now. I've seen nothing but the same identical bookshelf for two days now. Just row after row of them. I mean, come on, I love books as much as the next guy, but this is excessive. I'm obviously still moving forward, although I can see the signs hanging overhead passing by. Too bad none of them say exit. Not sure who I was addressing that last question to. Let's just say it's practice for the autobiography I'm going to write when I get out of here. I'll call it my perfectly normal trip to a regular old Ikea. Finally found some other people. Yeah, turns out I'm not the only poor guy trapped in here. Lucky for me, I guess. My sixth night here, two of those staff things came at me in the dark. Different from the first one I saw, but still messed up. Heard them coming and they were saying that the store was close and I had to leave the building. All nice and polite like. I'm not sure which part was weirder. That they didn't have mouths or that they were apparently trying to kill me while they were saying it. Came at me like rabid dogs. So I legged it, sprinting through the Ikea in the dark like a madman. I saw it when I cleared another stand of those giant stock shelves. All lit up with torches and floodlights. I built a whole town in here. Got a massive wall built out of shelves and beds and tables and whatever else. I swear to God, it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Anyway, I guess they saw me coming, or maybe they heard my manly bellows of fear, because they had a gate open and two people were waving me in. Heard the staff things slam into the gate behind me after it closed, still politely informing us that the store was now closed. They wandered off eventually, though. They called the town Exchange, because that's what's on the sign hanging from the ceiling directly above it. Exchange and Returns. All lit up against the night using lights they found and plugged into the power lines and there are beds and food and people. There were 50 wonderful people with regular sized limbs and a full set of facial features. It's not my seventh night here and the first one not spent in darkness. A full week living in Ikea. There's probably a TV show in that somewhere. Now, I'm, or now that I'm around other people, I'm starting to feel more normal. Maybe normal isn't the word. But after a week with only the sound of my own footsteps for company, I was becoming increasingly sure that I had gone nuts. That I was tied up in some padded room somewhere, banging my head against the wall, but... No, I, I feel quite sane now. Thank you very much. Apparently there are other towns here, some with more people, some with less. I found that fairly mind-boggling. How can that many people just go missing with no one noticing? Surely someone would have noticed that everyone who goes to Ikea just seems to vanish, or... Maybe it's not everyone. Maybe we're just lucky ones. The people here just call those staff monster things the staff. Apparently they're fine during the day, minding their own business, walking the aisles. But as soon as those lights go out, they go bonkers. So during the day, people go out to find food, water, whatever else they need. Apparently there are restaurants and shops that get randomly restocked. No one knows how. Maybe the staff do it. 
Apparently they aren't very good at their jobs though, which means that restocking sometimes takes a while. Which means the food needs to be rationed. Maybe if they weren't so busy chasing people around in the dark, they'd get more done. Anyway, when the night comes, the staff just go nuts and everyone holds up inside the walls. Apparently it's the same everywhere else in this place. Whatever this place is. The Your Ikea, from whence all other Ikea sprang are. Maybe we're all just still in the regular Ikea, and this is all some fever dream brought on by mind-numbing boredom. Who knows? Been here for ten days now. Most of the people I asked said they stopped keeping track a long time ago, and one guy, Chris, said he'd been in here for years. Years. Apparently there are rumors of people who do manage to get out, and people who see the exit only to have it vanish before their very eyes. And get the feeling not everyone believes that, but I do. Explains how we got stuck here in the first place. Sort of. I mean, come on. Staff monsters, row after row of endless, high-quality Swedish furniture. I don't know why they would find a disappearing door so hard to believe in. Anyway, I went out scavenging for food at a nearby shop with Sandra and Jerry today. Once you learn the landmarks of this place, it's not so hard to navigate. The overhead signs help out a lot, but there are others. Not too far in the distance, a huge section of those giant stock shells has collapsed against each other and way off in the east. We all assume it's east anyway. Apparently Ikea doesn't sell compasses. Some other kind of tower that looks like it's made of wood reaches all the way to the ceiling. Maybe they were trying to break through the roof. Lights up at night so there must be people there, but it's apparently a few days walk, which means it must be miles away, so no one really knows for sure. Apparently I got incredibly lucky sleeping out in the open for a week without getting ripped to bits by the staff. That's me. Lucky, lucky, lucky. We found some food in the shop. I guess the staff restocked it during the night, which was nice of them. There was a telephone on the wall, so I figured I'd try it out. There was a voice on the other end, but they were just talking nonsense. Random words strung together with no real meaning. You ever see a video of someone with aphasia? Yeah, yeah kind of sounded like that. He didn't answer me when I spoke to them anyway. Sandra says all the phones in here are the same. Oops, <laughs> Qu quit asking the journal questions again. I was thinking last night. The ceiling in this place is pretty high and as far as anyone can tell it goes on forever. Shouldn't there be some kind of weather in here? I'm sure I read about some NASA building that was so big it had its own weather patterns with clouds and stuff. This place is definitely bigger than that, but now that I think about it, I'm pretty sure I've never so much as felt a temperature change in here. I'll add it to the grand list of weird stuff. The staff attacked the exchange last night. Must have been 20 or 30 of them all just asking us to leave the store calm as you like, while trying to smash the walls down with their bare hands. Apparently this happens pretty regularly, so everyone was prepared for it. Knives from the restaurant, lawnmower blades made into hatchets, a fire axe, one guy, Wasm, even made a functional crossbow. Anyway, the walls have holes in them, which I hadn't noticed before, specifically so we can stab out the staff when they attack. Took a couple of them down myself. I don't seem to bleed, which is weird, but they go down as easy as a regular person once you start digging holes in them. We had to haul the bodies away in the morning. Apparently the dead ones will attract more during the night, so we had to get them away from exchange. We have a couple of those trolley things that we use to move big boxes around, so we load them up and took them over to pick up. Apparently people just name everything after whatever sign is hanging overhead. Pickup was grisly. There were hundreds, maybe thousands of dead staff all piled up. There was no smell, which was a blessing. Apparently in addition to not bleeding, these things don't rot either. My curiosity got the better of me. While we were unloading them, I took a look at one of the more cut up ones. They're just skin, or something that looks like skin, all the way through. No muscle or bone, no organs. Are they really even alive in the first place? They certainly seem like they have bones when they're moving around, pounding on the walls, and I'm sure I felt more resistance than just skin when the knife went in during the night. Maybe something happens to them when they die. Just one more thing on the ever-increasing list of weird stuff. That goes in here, I guess. Uh, something occurred to me. After the staff attack the other night, every time you see a situation like this on TV or in a film, it's like the end of the world or everyone's trapped on an island or whatever. Once groups like ours start to form, people always seem to turn on each other, fighting for food or dominance or whatever else. It hasn't happened here, 
Apparently people from other towns come by from time to time just to check in or occasionally trade if they're short on something. But everything's always cordial. Friendly, even. Maybe it's the threat of the staff or perhaps the constant restocking of supplies in the shops means there's nothing much to fight over. Maybe people are just better than they're generally given credit for. That's a nice thought. I think we'll go with that one. A dozen people showed up at the gates this afternoon from a town called Trolley's. Apparently the staff broke through the walls and tore the town apart during the night. These twelve were the only survivors out of over a hundred. We let them in, obviously. One more point in here, the human decency column, I suppose. Later I asked if anyone knew how many of these towns there were out there. Between us and the new folks, we managed to come up with over twenty names. Twenty towns filled with people, and who knows how many beyond that. The motto for this place should be, how is that even possible? Surely someone somewhere must be looking for the thousands of people that must be in here. It's been a little over two months now. Not that much changes as it turns out. A couple of new people showed up. Same story as the rest of us. Nice little trip to Ikea and suddenly they're trapped within Billy's bookcase house of faceless weirdos. The staff attack the exchange once or twice a week. We kill them and haul their bodies off. Sometimes they hurt some of us first though. They killed a guy called Jared a couple weeks back. It was awful, frankly. Turns out regular humans still bleed in here, even if the staff don't. We tried our best, but none of us are doctors. Jared was a good guy. He deserved better. We all do. It occurred to me a couple of days after that that none of us were really looking for a way out of here. I don't even know where we'd start. One of those quadcopter things with a camera attached buzzed past exchange today. Thought it meant someone was finally looking for us. The help was on the way. Apparently it's not the first time this has happened though. Same thing happened a few months ago and everyone's still here. No idea if it saw us, if it didn't stop, or if it just kept flying until we could no longer see us. Note. Based on recovery time of the journal, this entry appears to line up approximately with our first successful testing of piloting a drone inside of SCP-3008-1. Analysis of footage shows a walled settlement under a sign labeled Exchange and Returns. Attempts to relocate the settlement failed. Origin of previously sighted drones is unknown. I start talking to people about the stuff they miss from home during dinner today. Probably not the best idea I've ever had. Everyone seemed pretty down after that. A bunch of people they hear have families, husbands and wives, kids, dogs. Franklin apparently had a pet llama, though I'm not sure I buy that. But apparently some of the people here have seriously odd gaps in their knowledge. Three of them have never heard of the International Space Station. Two of them seem to think was the Prime Minister and, and one of them had apparently never even heard of the Statue of Liberty. I believe them too. They seem just as confused as the rest of us. The more I thought about it though, the more it started to explain a few things. What if the reason no one is looking for us missing people is because we haven't all come from the same place. This is going to sound weird. Maybe that should be the motto for this place. But what if all the people here have come from different dimensions, realities, whatever you want to call it. I've seen enough TV shows to know the drill. Sarah comes from a place where there's no Statue of Liberty. They didn't launch a space station where Wasm is from, and if everyone came here from different places, even ones that seem identical, there'd be no huge missing persons panic, no mass search. We'd just be a blip, a single missing person in a world of non-stop news. Well, that was a fun train of thought. Just realized that yesterday there was a six month anniversary of my arrival here. I wonder if Ikea sells party hats. The routine around here has remained more or less the same. More new folks show up, one every couple of weeks or so. Food supplies go up and down, but we never actually had a major shortage. Occasionally we get a visitor from one of the nearby towns, usually checkouts or aisle 630. We check in with each other from time to time, occasionally trade supplies if someone gets particularly low on something. And it's comforting, in a way. A reminder that we aren't alone in here. A small glimmer of civilization. Sometimes they bring medical supplies. Apparently there's a pharmacy a few towns down from checkouts that gets restocked every now and then, so they share what they can. I had never even heard of an Ikea with a pharmacy before, but at this point I wouldn't be surprised if we stumbled upon an Ikea organ harvesting lab. It would certainly explain the staff. Speaking of our faceless jailers, their attacks have gotten worse lately. Three or four times a week now, with twice as many staff as there used to be. No idea where they all came from, or why the attacks have increased. 
We tried following one of them during the day a few weeks ago, me and Sarah. Wanted to see if they led back to a staff room or something. Didn't seem to go anywhere, though. Just randomly walked through the aisles. We had to turn back before we found anything. We've been reinforcing the walls, trying to arm ourselves better. Certainly, no lack of materials to use. Wasm has been making more crossbows, but it's pretty slow going. Too bad Ikea doesn't sell guns. Note. No new personnel have entered SCP-3008 at site in the time span indicated in this entry. The attacks are getting pretty bad now, almost every night and with so many staff that the bodies almost pile high enough for others to climb the walls. I think we're in real trouble here. Exchanges. I think exchange is done. We got hit pretty bad last night. Not many casualties, but the wall is wrecked. We finally figured out why the attacks had been escalating too. A box of supplies had a chunk of one of the staff in there. No idea how it happened, but apparently a piece of one of them will draw as many of them as a full body. Too late now in any case. There's too many bodies for us to haul and we still have time to fix the wall before night. Candace has called a meeting. I suspect there will be talk of a banding exchange. Maybe try and get a shelter at checkouts or something. It's already getting late though. I don't think we'll have time to make it. Maybe some of us will. I was fine for that first week out in the dark after all. But then again, how often can I keep getting lucky? I'm only writing this for a sense of closure, I guess. For me or anyone who finds this, this is the final entry here. I hope who's ever reading this is doing so from the outside of this place. My biggest fear, if I do die tonight, I'll just wake up here again in the morning. Note. This is the last entry. It is assumed that while attempting to reach the checkout settlement, he was separated from the rest of his group by a pursuing SCP-3008-2 instance and happened upon the exit.